I see today mostly there are students. If you if you want to look at the slides from the last two lectures, they're up on the web already. Um, first one was an overview of deep learning. Second one was uh, mostly about coding deep learning with uh, Python and TensorFlow and so on. So today I thought I'd pick up a topic I feel is a very exciting topic in research in deep learning. So if you're wondering what, what there is to be done in deep learning, uh, this is a good area, learning representations, right? I mean, that's my personal preference. There's so many other topics you, you, know, you could do. But I think there's a, a lot of implications here. So what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, during this hour and a half is I'll start with uh, the importance of representation. What is this representation and why is this uh, important? And then we'll talk about, some of this is review, it's not research. Uh, I'll talk about various methods of learning representations, autoencoders and convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks all learn uh, a representation of the data. And after we talk about these methods of representation, I'm going to get into this topic of uh, uh, disentangling variables. <laughs> it's like a fascinating topic, <laughs> right? Philosophers talk about how you should disentangle yourself, <laughs> right? And it turns out it's important in, in computer science also. How do you disentangle? What are all the complications that are occurring? And so clearly see what are all the factors that are all entangled in the data. How do you disentangle? And then the last part I'll cover is explainable AI. So that is considered to be a very important future topic. Is today's AI is all about learning large numbers of parameters, millions of parameters to be learned. Uh, okay, fine, we spend all the time and effort to learn these parameters. But, and it, it's, it helps you make a decision, the kind of task that you would like to solve, it helps you solve it. It will solve, solve it for you, play chess or whatever, whatever it is you want to uh, use it for. But then the question comes in is, uh, why did you, why did you choo choose that answer? Can you explain your answer? And it turns out that most of today's AI is a black box. This deep learning is a black box. Uh, not much introspection possible into this black box. Uh, so how is that important to be able to explain yourself? If you're going to be using AI for very important tasks, which uh, affect life and property and whatnot. Uh, I think it's important to be able to explain why it is. You know, if, if you if you apply for a loan and the bank comes comes back and says no, we can't give you a loan, and you ask why, but they say, well, the algorithm says no. It's <laughs> not a very satisfactory answer. Maybe you'll go away. Say fine, go to another bank. But uh, what if it is being used in uh, a criminal court proceedings where all the evidence is put into the computer and it says, yes, this person is guilty, should be executed. <laughs> I don't think it's satisfactory to say algorithm said so. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to explain, uh, explain what it is. So these are all tied together. So we're saying, let us look back not from the input output behavior, but something in between. How did you how did you come up with this conclusion to be able to explain yourself? So representations are exciting and important because of that. All right, so we'll explore these ideas. Some of it are classical stuff. Some of you uh, are all experts. I know many of you are quite advanced on, on deep learning. And so know many of these concepts, but just let's just uh, patiently look at a few more, few of these ideas once again, eventually coming to the point where uh, we, we look to the future, uh, disentangling variables and explanation-based AI and all that. 
Okay, so this is just a summary of all the topics. What is the importance of representation? Representation learning methods, autoencoders, convolutional networks, recurring networks. Okay, another topic we'll briefly go touch over is the transfer learning. Does everyone have to learn uh, the stuff from scratch, uh, squeeze all the data? Then there is a whole lot of data. Do we all need to be crunching them through our networks in the learning phase with a cost function and and uh, and then uh, running back propagation, doing gradient descent, things like that. It's a lot of work. Um, so fortunately, there's a solution called transfer learning where you can learn in one domain and use those files for all the parameters you have learned and use it in some other task that you really need to solve. It's kind of interesting. So you transfer your learning from one domain to another, which I think is an exciting topic. And as I mentioned, disentangling variables and explaining AI. So these are the topics. So importance of representations, <laughs> particularly those of us who travel uh, between countries, like, you know, I, I come from US to India, I'm constantly uh, converting representations. It, it, and in Bangalore, it says 25 degrees uh, Celsius right now. I said, what does that mean? You know, I have to convert into Fahrenheit, which we use in the US. I said, oh, that's 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now I know because, you know, how cold it gets uh, where I live. So we convert temperature and then um, somebody says, uh, Okay, how much do you weigh, you know, okay, maybe 150 pounds or whatever, okay, how many in kilograms, Six, 65 kilograms, 68 kilograms, <laughs> I can't appreciate kilograms at all, uh, completely brainwashed by the old American system, which works in, uh, in pounds and Fahrenheit and miles, you know, say, okay, how far is it, how far is it from Bangalore to Mysore, I knew that long ago, it was what we used to say, it's about 80 miles, now I don't know, it's in kilometers, right? So you have to convert. Now today, all, most of you are familiar only in kilometers. And if I say miles, I don't know if it makes any sense to you. So all these uh, units are there, right? Which we can't, we, we, have to rep, we have to convert. And today in the newspaper, it says uh, uh, the government of India is going to retaliate to the United, United States uh, tariffs on imports from India. Uh, they say, okay, we're going to put tariffs too. And uh, the, the tariff, the duty on uh, American goods coming into uh, uh, India is going to be 240 million dollars tariffs uh, India is going to put on it. Right, I can see what the 240 million is, but then uh, most Indians would want to know how much is that in, 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 in rupees, 240 million. Boy, that's a really hard <laughs> conversion to convert those big numbers into, in dollars that too, into rupees. And I said, okay, how much is uh, 1 million dollars in Indian rupees? Uh, it, Today's rate is 68 uh, uh, rupees. It's gone up a little bit. It's 68 Indian rupees to a dollar. And 1 million is uh, 1 followed by 6 zeros. So 68 INR times 1 million is, that turns out to be uh, 680, oh, 68 million INR. And it's really, uh, we want to say it in 6 crores and 80 lakhs, right? So 1 million dollars is 6 crores and 80 lakhs rupees as of, as of today. Uh, so 200 and Today's tariffs is 240 million. Okay, let's say 200 million. So that, you got to multiply that thing. That's a. Uh, I find it really hard. Convert uh, six crores uh, uh, and 80 lakhs. Uh, uh, multiply that by 200. You know, it comes out to be some 1,360 crores or some such number, which is un unbelievably hard. I'd vote for converting to the million system in India. I don't know how you all feel about that. Anyway, representation. Uh, here is another one. Uh, let's say uh, you live in the U.S. and uh, th this is a picture of, of uh, a monument in, in Washington, D.C. called the Lincoln Memorial. It honors, uh, we used to have some great presidents in the U.S. called <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was one of them. And if you go to the monument, it, this is what it looks like on it. It says Texas MDCCCC XLV and California MDCCCCL. It's all uh, Roman numerals on it. They, they put all these uh, Roman numerals on on old monuments and things like that. And well, what is that? You know, it's, it's, it's the year in Roman numerals. And uh, all right, uh, and supposing I wanna, these are the years that these states got admitted to the US Union apparently. And you know, if you're just curious, did Texas join the US earlier than California? If you ask that question, you'd have to convert these into 
into that and how do you convert it? That's another conversion, huge problem. Uh, this is a simple shortcut. If you remember the phrase medical Xavier, this is uh, M stands for 1000, this is 500, this is 100, this is 50, that is 10, that is 5 and that is 1. Right, so that's how we remember <laughs> what those letters mean. And you can now convert that, uh, this MDCCCXLV using this notation, that's a thousand and that's uh, a 500 and so on. You see that is 1845. Texas was admitted in 1845. And then you can do the same thing with California. You think 1500, 1800, 1850. Okay, Texas came in before California. So it's a representation. So representation is a daily thing we do. Rupees, dollars, uh, all kinds of things we are converting every day using using our brain, right? So that's about daily life. It turns out uh, representation is also important in computer science. Uh, this is classic computer science about sorting and inserting numbers and all that. So if you have a sorted list and you want to put a number in it, the uh, because it's already sorted uh, list, it's order n, if n in n elements in the list. But if you use a special thing called as a red black tree, uh, right, left is uh, smaller than parent and uh, right is larger than parent and if you organize it in this form of a red black tree, uh, then inserting an element becomes only order log n if it is represented like that. Ah, what's the lesson to be learnt is that the representation can be uh, important in, uh, uh, in efficiency. Same thing with the Roman and, uh, uh, and uh, we call it Arabic, it's the Indian, Indian number system which involves the zero. It's so much more efficient to do those dates rather than having to convert them, remembering MD and so on. So representation is important. It turns out so representation is important to us in daily life, representation is important in computer algorithms, representation is important in machine learning also. And uh, supposing we had a set of points, this is uh, some two dimensional space X and Y. And if we use Cartesian coordinates, uh, supposing the data look like this, one class was surrounding the other. Then we ask the question, how do we separate these classes? What kind of a classifier do we need? We'd say, well, we need a quadratic classifier that uh, draws a circle around it. Inside the circle is this, outside. It's kind of complicated classifier. Quadratic involves power of the variables and so on. On the other hand, if you took this very data and converted it from the XY coordinate system, to polar coordinates involving R and theta, it turns out this same data is mapped, looks like this in this space. So, wow, that's simple. I can separate the two classes now by a straight line or a linear classifier. So representations have a very practical uh, value to it. So that's one, one part of representation. So this is a slide I, I took from uh, lecture number one on differences between AI systems, rule-based systems, classic machine learning system, and uh, deep learning systems. And that is actually represent, uh, written as representation learning. There's a rule-based system, classical machine learning, that's a representation learning. Representation learning goes from input, we learn some features from the data, and then we map so these boxes involve machine learning, learning the features and then mapping from features to the output. Uh, deep learning involves input simple features, additional layers, more abstract features, mapping from the features finally. So deep learning is layers and layers of the representation. So it seems like what is the difference between, uh, between deep learning and, and previous types of learning methods is we are learning representations. So representations are important in machine learning, not just a way of uh, making it more computationally efficient, but somehow these things uh, help us perform our task hopefully better. So as I promised, we look at uh, three methods of uh, representation learning and I went over this briefly also during the first lecture, it was uh, called autoencoder. Uh, which is the uh, which is a good project number one for a course on deep deep learning or machine learning. I mentioned the project number one, which was uh, to solve the FizzBuzz problem. Uh, I gave the task to my engineering college interns who are here. Uh, they started with me last Tuesday and said, 
well, okay, why don't you take a week and learn Python and TensorFlow and and come back to me, implement uh, FizzBuzz. Uh, one of you implemented in TensorFlow, another one implemented in Gluon, another one implemented in PyTorch. And okay, do you think uh, a week is good to, for you to learn to do all this? Uh, so maybe that's too much. You know, they want to come sooner. So they came back to me two days later, saying, "Here is the here is the version in uh, in TensorFlow already done." And <laughs> so I have to challenge myself to give, what is it I what is it I gave them next to to learn? A good next project is autoencoder. It's, it's a very satisfying project. It is you simply give some data. And here are a bunch of uh, images of cats, and uh, this autoencoder should be able to reproduce the images of the cats. It goes through some compression, a rep representation, and you are able to recreate it. Encoder converts the input to a representation, and decoder converts representation back to input. So it's a it's a good first project or it's a second project, I should say, after after uh, his buzz. So. In this uh, autoencoder idea, here is an original image. I guess we work with images. Cats are too complicated because you're going to have RGB and lots of resolution, too much of computing time needed. How about simply uh, black and white scans of handwritten digits? So you would use an encoder to get a compressed representation and a decoder, you get a reconstructed. Reconstru we reconstruct the input. All right? So the hidden layer here describes code to represent the input. So how do we? How do we, what is the code? How do we represent it? And that is the hidden code here. And autoencoders are data specific. Whatever you're training it on, you are, you are inputting all these images. Maybe they're all the handwritten images, not just twos, all handwritten numerals. And it finds a way of compressing it. Because what we are doing is we are learning it by standard uh, gradient descent and all that. If with this input, it should be producing the output. If it doesn't produce that output, go back and change the uh, parameters and so on until you get a reasonably good construction. And this part here tells you uh, how efficient that representation should be. So autoencoders are data specific because they're learning on the data. They're very different from MP3 or JPEG and that kind of thing, whose job is to produce the data exactly, right? That is lossless compression. Here we want a lossy compression. So autoencoders are lossy and autoencoders are learned. They're learned from the data. Whereas in uh, in other kinds of MPEG or, or JPEG and so on, we put in properties. We know something about uh, the nature of images, nature of sound, so on. We use those kind of properties. Uh, here, none of that goes on, and uh, we just learn it from the data. I mentioned this example also, I think, last time. Uh, what good is an autoencoder is once it learns their internal representation, supposing we were using it on, on fashion design, uh, inputs and outputs and some kind of representation. And we could use that representation and uh, modify along different dimensions in that in that representation, make some changes. Every change of that will give you a new design and the output. Of course, we have first learned the learned the mappings and then uh, we, we, we make some changes in it. And uh, so we could we could uh, use this uh, as, a, as a fashion designer to, to be able to produce uh, new objects and apparently all these designs were created by this commercial uh, commercial company called Deep Style. So the general structure of an autoencoder, a lot of theory uh, in this autoencoder. People are acti actively working on some research problems with autoencoders. So we can represent it uh, in this computational graph, such as x. So we apply a function to that to produce h. And then uh, from h, we reconstruct r using a function g. And the network has two parts, an encoder function, h is equal to f of x, and a decoder reconstruction, r is equal to g of h. And the model is forced to prioritize which aspects of input are copied. So you're going to limit the capacity of h and learn useful data properties. And here is an example of a particular design. Let's say you wanted to implement your own autoencoder and see how it, how it does. The encoder is taking some images here. And it takes all these values multiplied by a matrix W of weights to, to a smaller size here, smaller size matrix multiplication. And there is a code layer here and reconstruct. So you, you are now developing an encoder and a decoder in this uh, whole process of, uh, of autoencoding. The mathematics of it is also interesting to look at. It's not too complicated. 
So how do you actually train this autoencoder? Uh, this is uh, we are going with this encoder from X to H to X prime. H again is this, is becoming a standard symbol for hidden H for hidden. It's a, some kind of a vector uh, H there, and the F is a mapping from X to H, and G is a mapping from H to X, and uh, we would like to find uh, the uh, mapping. You know, the H is given by sigma one. This is kind of sigmoid function W X plus B with a bias and so on. We are getting H from from X, and similarly we are getting X prime from H, and so we need to figure out these weights W W prime B and B prime. And so, how do we how do we determine those weights? Would be by defining a loss function. So here is the loss of x x prime is given by the difference between x and x prime, and by just substituting that expression here, this is what we're trying to minimize here. So it becomes a standard problem of minimization. Uh, so we uh, we solve it by using gradient descent. We want to minimize this function here, and by running through a, starting with a, some. Uh, pro, from set of initial values for the parameters, and uh, we keep on updating it using gradient descent, and uh, so that's how we learn it. So that was the basic idea of uh, an autoencoder to learn a representation. That's not all about our, uh, reg, uh, autoencoders. There is also this additional thing called regularization, just like in any machine learning program. Regularization plays an essential role. And so many different regularizers have been proposed. Uh, uh, a regularizer uh, is a sparsity of representation, such as, uh, and uh, that, that's one of them. So, and then smallness of the derivative of the representation. Uh, one classic example is to use uh, uh, the norm uh, of the weight vector, and you want to minimize that also. It gives you some more of a sparse representation. Robustness to noise, robustness to missing inputs, and so on. So there are all kinds of whole bunch of ideas, mathematical ideas that are there. To uh, uh, to uh, and why do we want to do this? Is we want to minimize this, but by regularization, we uh, hope to generalize better. So this will work well with the data set you're trying to optimize. But then, what about data you have not you have not seen? So that's that's the problem of machine learning. It's not just optimization. But that of generalization, and these methods of regularization by making the uh, the solution sparse and small, so on, uh, these things uh, turn out to work pretty well in terms of generalization. Okay. Um, sparse autoencoders. Uh, loss includes a sparsity penalty, so this is how we represent it. Here's the loss function plus an omega of h here, and the penalty limits the capacity of the encoder. And together, the loss function and the and the uh, and the penalty force the hidden representation to capture information about the data generating distribution. Of course, there's a lot of theory that one could do here. What kind of generalization does it do, and so on? So, typically used to learn features for another task such as classification. Ah, why would you want to be doing autoencoders? Is uh, they are also useful to perform uh, another task such as uh, classification. Sparsity penalty can yield a model that has learned useful features as a byproduct, and you can use this for uh, another task. Maybe you don't have lots of data in the classification task. An autoencoder might be a good way to do that. Anyway, what we're talking about today is, is titled as a research. So there are going to be a number of little issues here that people are, are working on to learn these things better. Another very interesting thing, this is a famous uh, example of the MNIST digits. I mentioned to you that uh, the fruit fly of uh, machine learning and AI is handwritten digits. You know, it, it, it was the, an important topic many years ago when we were trying to solve problems for the post office and so on, uh, if post offices exist at all today. But they still continue to be uh, a, a task uh, which you can get, get uh, you can you can you can get get going very quickly, and so this is what the MNIST digits look like. These are all handwritten digits captured off of uh, postal addresses and so on. So auto uh, encoders concentrate data on a low dimensional manifold. So it says what happens here is even though these are all represented in pixel space, every one of these uh, may be uh, a, 
you know, 100 by 100 or 1000 by 1000, some size uh, image there, uh, they don't necessarily all spread themselves around in this whole image space. And for instance, uh, there could be a very low dimensional, two dimensional space. And here the images have been projected uh, into a, a two dimensional space using a PCA here. And it uh, turns out that like nines are uh, or along a line here. And uh, it's a one, we say that it's a one dimensional manifold in 784 dimensional space. So each of these images are in 784 dimensions. And uh, it turns out that as we change these uh, nines a little bit, little bit, little bit and so on. So they kind of move around some kind of a low dimensional manifold. And this is uh, an important issue for learning representations. Um, and uh, this is the kind of thing we want to find out is uh, uh, what kind of manifolds they lie on in this low dimensional space and what can we learn uh, from these. And, uh, and they become eventually important for this explanation based AI that I mentioned. Uh, let's take another example here. Here the images are all the, I uh, think they, they are the CIFAR, CIFAR data set where we have things like uh, trucks and uh, autos and uh, horses and dogs and cats and so on. And, uh, and this is a representation learning method. So here we are uh, using uh, the original input here and the representation learning method. Some new representation is obtained by the representation learning method. And that's being mapped here into, into classes, let's say. So the auto encoder is a, unsupervised learning method of learning a representation. We are not giving any labels. We're saying just reproduce this input. Uh, in, a, in, a, a, in a supervised learning method, we may be presenting this and saying, well, these should be the class labels out, uh, out here. Uh, that would be a supervised learning method. So you can use either unsupervised learning or supervised learning. And uh, these methods end up finding a representation where the data lies on some kind of a lower dimensional manifold here. And, and we say an embedding is a low dimensional vector with fewer dimensions in the ambient space. We're using these words. These were in the ambient space and we are now in some kind of a low dimensional representational space. And we, if, if these uh, data points, these are the training images. These are all the uh, dogs over here. And these are all the horses here. These are the autos here, all lying in some kind of a low dimensional space here. We refer to this as a manifold, some kind of a surface. This is not just a two or three dimensional thing or even one dimensional thing. It could be several dimensions. Um, and so, so this is the, the kind of mapping that goes on. And autoencoders learn a representation function that maps uh, any point into its embedding. So this is the embedding we refer to uh, here. All right. So an embedding is a low dimensional vector with few dimensions, fewer dimensions. All right, so that's uh, the kind of thing that an autoencoder does. And before proceeding further, uh, lots of you are interested in uh, not just images like cats and dogs or handwritten digits. Your interest is not in images, but you're interested in other kinds of data. And, uh, and what about uh, natural language processing? And uh, what happens here? Uh, it turns out it's not very different, which is surprising. The natural language is also processed similar way. And, uh, and here, is, let's look at uh, the idea of uh, embedding here. The training data is obtained in a fairly simple way. So the top box, let me see if this works. Oh, okay, this works. The top box here is uh, we have source text and we, are, we create training samples from the source text. The source text is what? The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, right? It's a famous NLP sentence where every letter of the alphabet is used. And we are putting a window of three over here. And uh, we have the is the first one here. Training samples are the quick, the brown. So we have these pairs here, the quick, the brown. And then uh, we look at uh, the next three over here. Uh, this is the quick brown fox. So now from that we get a quick uh, uh, the and then we have uh, quick brown and quick fox. So this one is adjacent to these words. And in the third one we have the quick brown fox jumps. So this creates the training samples of uh, uh, this is uh, 
uh, the quick brown uh, yeah this is brown the brown quick brown uh, fox and brown uh, jumps right so we create these kinds of training samples we are pairing words together basically saying these are the kinds of words that appear together in in english language let's say and uh, then what happens uh, then what happens is uh, we start with uh, the one hot vector we talked about this last time let's say we have 30000 words in our vocabulary so the input vector now is a 30000 uh, uh, 30000 size vector where only a one in the in the position corresponding to the particular word we are trying to encode here and it goes through uh, a set of uh, uh, linear uh, hidden layer linear neurons a standard neural network type of situation and then we have the output layer to the softmax classifier and then we are mapping uh, these words here from each word and uh, so we know which output is the desired one because those are obtained from the training samples over here so we use the training samples to tell us what the mapping should be so this is running through all the words uh, this is probability the word if a randomly chosen nearby position is abandoned, ability, able, gone and things like that. So we are going through a small network here of only uh, 300 neurons here. We started with, uh, with uh, 10,000 or, uh, or 30,000 possibilities here, go to 300 possibilities and then we go to the output. So this becomes a supervised learning problem by using these training samples to figure out what this vector should be. So this one hot vector now gets mapped into 300 values. So we don't kill ourselves by saying, what is this 30,000 size vector, one hot vector? No, no, that's just for the training part. And then we end up with a 300 dimensional vector. So each word becomes a 300 dimensional vector, which has got all kinds of uh, useful information about uh, its semantics, because they all, these, uh, these words appear together. And, uh, and then, uh, so these are uh, these. Uh, then we can look at the word embeddings over here, and uh, and so this is uh, a embeddings of words used in a similar way for the purpose of machine translation, English and German words. Uh, and so there are English words uh, in blue and German words in purple. They all seem to be together in this embedded space. So we do this magic of using some task of uh, of words appearing together and using this kind of a mapping of finding an embedding which uh, puts words that are that occur together in in some place in this in this space here so that is the kind of thing that goes on in nlp and these two tables are also worth looking at it says the word airplane uh, maps to ride see say near and with these kinds of probabilities and some other irrelevant words uh, with zeros so this is the kind of uh, thing that airplane is asso associated with the ride, airplane is associated with sea, and so on. So this kind of thing it learns in this process. And how big are these embedded spaces is an interesting one. Here is one I came across, data set, tweet data uh, without spam word. All right, so this is uh, some data set that's available. Number of tweets is 198 million. And the number of words in the training data is 2.8 billion. Number of unique words uh, in the trained uh, embedding model is uh, 1.9 million. Vector dimension uh, is 300. 300 seems to be very popular with the NLP folks. And uh, there are some other thresholds and so on. So people have done this kind of stuff, taking you know billions of words and, and millions of tweets and so on and figured out what should these be mapping? So every word now is just a 300 dimensional vector, which is very rich in what kind of information is encoded. So that representation is of value. So this whole idea, one slide representation of natural language processing is the idea of word to vec. I just came across this just the other day. Uh, this is a paper in ICML 2018. I don't think it's over yet. It's probably happening now, this summer is happening ICML 2018 and uh, they used uh, data they call it as historical linguistics data uses cognates words shared across languages and this is kind of an embedding uh, they saw there and they use some special methods called hyperbolic geometry and uh, the method of stochastic gradient descent they use in the learning 
part is uh, Riemann uh, stochastic gradient descent and uh, they were able to cluster these things in a, some kind of circular type of space, hyperbolic geometrical space and, uh, and they were looking at common words between languages, that is what the cognates are, words shared across languages and used in a similar way and they cluster very nicely here, uh, Indo-European, Vedic and Persian and all these things and uh, for example, uh, the, this is uh, Hindi and uh, Indian languages coming over here and then there are other languages and so on. So, this is you know hot off the press, one of the papers that that is just being presented now on how this embedding idea can be extended in other ways, but of course some special uh, mechanisms have to come into play and embeddings were, are being used uh, to do all kinds of studies now about uh, languages as well. Okay, so that is about uh, autoencoders, that is about embedding, the idea of embedding that there is something happening, mapping things into some space. Now we move on to the classic uh, convolutional neural networks. That is also a method of obtaining representations, but in a supervised learning way. Um, basically in convolutional neural networks, uh, we, we use sparseness. Normally we have a bunch of X's as input here and then we have a bunch of S's as the outputs here and we have full connectivity from this layer to this layer, everything connected to everything over here. There's so many connections, so many weights to be learned. In uh, convolutional neural networks, we say let's get rid of so many of these. Uh, we'll allow this X3 over here not to be connected to all these S1 through S5. It can only be connected to S2, S3 and S4, only three of them. So each of them has a small limited view here. So that's the idea of bringing in sparseness and, and ignore uh, the effects of one layer to the next layer, all right, which is basically the idea. And then of course you can say, well, I know the idea of convolution. I know it from mathematics. I know it from image processing. Turns out the way convolution is being used by the deep learning people, not exactly you know, one to one with uh, the idea of mathematical convolution. Uh, there is a similarity, uh, however. So we know that in convolution, what we do in image processing, we have an image here of uh, ones, twos and zeros and we apply a convolution kernel which might be a three by three, which takes the values in this three by three and uses some set of weights that have been prescribed. For instance, we might have these set of weights here so we multiply these weights to this set of pixels and then we add them all up. For instance, this whole thing becomes a minus eight because there's a four here and, and zeros mostly and so on. It, that's how it, so it replaces this whole thing by this one value here. And we refer to this as the convolutional kernel. And here is the new pixel value destination pixel. So this was the idea that Jan LeCun came up with. Uh, and, uh, and so it seemed like a, way of uh, somehow applying some kind of an operator on an image. But it also f uh, was important that uh, it is saying it is not an arbitrary matrix multiplication that goes on from this layer to the next layer, but it is some kind of some limiting. We are not saying everything does not connect to everything else. So that is the sparsity that is being brought in in convolutional neural networks. So convolutional networks have sparse interactions accomplished by making the kernel smaller than the input. And uh, let's see what I have here. Okay, all right. So that's a, that's my very simple one slide representation. You know, what is this convolution? And that is simply a method of uh, simplifying, going from one layer to the next layer. And it, it it captures essentially all kinds of local information. It also had has other properties of sharing and so on. Another thing that goes on in these convolutional networks, we have what's called as a pooling layer. A pooling function replaces the output of the net at a certain location with a summary statistic of the nearby inputs. So it says a max pooling operation reports the maximum output within a rectangular neighborhood. It says uh, you uh, apply it in a particular way where we are taking just the max value and then or we take the average in a rectangular neighborhood or an L2 norm in a rectangular neighborhood and so on. So. What I'm saying is we go from layer to layer, we have a convolutional layer and then what's called a pooling layer. So they seem to always go together and why do they use it, we'll look at it. 
this is a uh, one architecture um, a fairly current paper uh, on uh, on an architecture they're called VGG and I you know seems to be readily available and people are using it all the time goes from images and we have uh, you look at this diagram here what happens with these images here convolutional layer plus uh, relu is the rectified linear unit followed by maximum max pooling fully connected and then soft max so the last thing is these things are all fully connected and then we're using soft max here some kind of recognition task i suppose for cfar or something but the processing involves uh starting with the full image and then you are redu reducing the size of the image to here and this particular network does it using these ideas and what good was this this particular network vgg is a convolutional neural neural network model and some of these presumably are are, are convolution pooling convolution pooling so on and uh, this particular one the model achieved 93% top 5 test accuracy in image net now that's a more challenging data set than uh, mnist or cfar we go to image net image net is a data set of over 14 million images belonging to 1000 classes so it's a much more challenging one actually this is where the deep learning networks uh, made a breakthrough previously svm were thought of as the top classifier so on and uh, the differences apparently started appearing when they started showing that these uh, models perform better than the classical methods okay so that's my very quick view of another method of representation we're learning some representation what is it it's learning you know we're not answering that we're simply saying we is just uh, processing the image that that's a black black box and then we want to move beyond that saying we want to do better than that yeah is large yeah 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 could be so you don't yeah that's right svm is a two class classifier <laughs> right how do you generalize it to a, a, a thousand classes i'm not sure what it was but this is the historical perspective that they're saying when did deep learning break through for a, for about 15 20 years we were saying svm is the ultimate there's nothing more you can do and the breakthrough apparently happened with cnn in these competitions I don't know if it was this thing, this problem of the competition, but uh, competitions like this is when they yeah, showed it. Hmm? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here on representation. So we've talked about auto encoders. We talked about convolutional neural networks. Some idea we know have about representations. We'll also talk about. And we talked about uh, word to vec for language. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, language type of problems. And these are called recurrent neural networks. So these are very interesting things uh, where uh, we allow for a time variable to come into play because the language and, uh, and sound and speech and so on involve time sequences here. It's not just a static image at a given point of time. A video also is a time sequence here. How do we model these things? Um, very useful uh, type of graph that they use in uh, deep learning is computational graphs and RNN stands for a recurrent neural network. So this is uh, one way of writing what a, re a recurrent neural network looks like. X is the input, H is the hidden unit, and then uh, this uh, O is the output, and then L is the loss function, and uh, Y impinges upon this one also, the arrow this way. So the whole process can be written like this. We go from x to o and then with this hidden and then there is the loss function which uh, uh, is influenced by what should be the right output and if this is the computational graph we use for uh, a recurrent neural network we can unfold it with respect to time because h gets multiplied by w with respect to time so we can say well for three time frames we have the same thing repeated three times over here and we have some initial values for the hidden value hidden units and and so on so in a way this is referred to as an unfolded network and then we say well okay if it's going to depend only on three time instances what's the big deal you can just process it exactly like you did with cnns and you're just uh, going up three time steps here and and it captures all kinds of dependencies that, that exist in time in principle that seems okay um so 
So the computational graphs include uh, cycles and uh, here are the equations for these uh, for these uh, uh, time steps here you know uh, inputs and, and hidden units and outputs. But there is a problem with uh, just having a few time steps which is handled. This is the thing that from what I understand uh, is revolutionizing all of natural language processing. Now everybody is saying I am using oh my, my slide got completely screwed up here. Uh, it's falling one on top of the other. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and uh, I can see it on my screen either. So uh, mainly, it, it is a different architecture. It is not a simple unfolding that goes on. Uh, an LSTM module has some memory, long-term memory. That's what they talk about. It's called long short-term memory. So what is the drawback of the classic RNN? is that uh, you can only depend on the previous one or the previous one to that if your unfolding is to three steps or four steps or five steps that is all its memory is which may not be satisfactory because uh, you, um, you might have a long passage of text uh, where you are referring back to something you said way before. Says, uh, um, you know I am visiting France you would have said in the beginning and then there is a lot of discussion that goes on and uh, you know, you would say the local people, you know, something they might be saying and you are saying, what is the local people, okay, okay, you are visiting France which was way back earlier on. So that is called long term memory rather than simply in the previous word and the previous sentence and so on that is not satisfactory. This particular architecture, it has got a cleverly designed architecture here in this LSTM which has got things that are remembered and then the gates open and forgotten and so on. It is uh, a little bit intricate but extremely important for you to know and learn because this seems to be the building block for all of NLP. So NLP core conferences now I think are dominated by this. Many of you I think are NLP experts so my apologies for my very simplistic view of it but this is the, this is the solution for a language. Ah core idea behind LSTM. Uh, the key to LSTM is the cell state C, the horizontal line running through the diagram. They call, call the top line as a conveyor belt, runs through entire chain with minor interactions and LSTM does have the ability to remove add information to state regularly and the gates are an optional way to let information through. So you learn a different kind of module here called as an LSTM module. Okay, so that was my two slide feel for uh, RNNs and LSTM. You learn these representations, some set of parameters for a little bit more complicated networks. So transfer learning is uh, about uh, transferring uh, the learning from one task to another. Learner must perform two or more different tasks. But we assume that the factors that explain the variations in A are relevant to the variations to be captured for learning B. All right. So what is an example? Visual classification, significantly more data and distribution sampled from cats and dogs, then learn to quickly generalize to ants and wasps, right. So what if we did all the training with cats and dogs because lots of images are available in uh, the data sets such as uh, uh, what was that, uh, no CIFAR or something, CIFAR might have or ImageNet, right. So there might be lots of them. but but you want to develop something now for ants and wasps, can we use that? So the same kind of thing uh, might be possible and, uh, and these, these pictures show them for uh, language processing as well. I do not know if you can read this, words in some kind of a representation W in this word space and then this is uh, tasks here, W and F are used to perform task A. Later, uh, this is task A here and we are using F to perform task A. Later G can learn to perform task B, this is B here based on the representation of W that is common. So a common representation word space, this is not about cats and dogs but it is about language and we have some kind of a representation here, maybe we can do it for one type of one language translation or another language translation or to be able to answer questions in language and so on. So we are using a shared representation to perform that and uh, this one here is uh, what about combining words and images? This seems like another very peculiar thing that is uh, uh, attracted a lot of attention in the last few years uh, is uh, dealing with uh, 
pictures and captions that go with it. So they might they're referring to the same thing. There are representations that could be shared here. So here are words uh, that are represented in this word space here W, and then this is images represented using a deep convolutional network, and these two together form a word space. So this is embedding words and images in a single representation. And you see some very uh, interesting pieces of work people are showing, saying here is an image, what is the scene? It comes back and says, oh, that is a market where they're selling some fruits and that kind of thing. It comes up with a description of what it is. It seems quite remarkable that the uh, program is able to interpret what an image is saying, uh, where it is using these kinds of uh, uh, joint embeddings between language and, uh, and images. And again, uh, this is referred to as transfer learning. So the success of transfer learning, uh, so it says unsupervised deep learning for transfer learning is found success in machine learning competition. So apparently there are competitions here. <laughs> Uh, I've seen that uh, IASC wins many competitions uh, uh, generally conducted. I don't know if you have participated in this one. Each participant is given data from distribution P1 illustrating some set of categories. So participants uh, learn a feature space. I guess the cats and dogs. You're given lots of images of cats and dogs and you learn a representation. And uh, so you have to do that first, mapping raw input to a representation space. This transformation is applied to samples from P2. So this could be the, the ants and wasps. And the linear uh, classifier is trained from very few examples. So there is a fully connected layer that's coming up afterwards. And which is telling you which ones are wasps and which ones are ants, but not a huge data set. All the learning has taken place on some, another data, but you do need some the last layer would be done by the task at hand. As deeper representations are used, learned uh, purely unsupervised from P1 performance improves. And uh, for deeper representations, fewer samples are needed. So there's an interesting connection between uh, number of, this is based on, you know, people's uh, running experiments on this. All right, so that's, uh, that's uh, transfer learning, a simple idea of transfer learning, going from one task to another task. I would recommend to a lot of you students who are starting out uh, to think of the idea of transfer learning. Because you say, oh, how do I get that volume of images for my task? And uh, where do I get the compute power to deal with all of this? So you could uh, look at the files. Like I, I showed the example of natural language processing with tweets. So they're making available those kinds of embedded representations. And uh, you, could, uh, you could use that as your starting point uh, to do whatever task you want to do, right? I found a group that was working on forensics. They're looking at shoe print matches and so on. They said, we don't have enough examples of all these shoe prints and so on. We're just using uh, what other people have uh, developed. So we're transferring all that information, the method of embedding, uh, the weights necessary to create the embedding from another domain and training the last part. Uh, one more thing to keep in mind is uh, I only talked about uh, uh, a, a simple uh, deterministic uh, autoencoder. Uh, an autoencoder can also be a probabilistic. Uh, and this will be some of the topic I'll be talking about in my next, next lecture, which will be about generative models uh, in deep learning. So here, generative models with latent variables can be uh, viewed as a particular form of autoencoder. So we have an image, encoder, and then the decoder, here's an image, but this box here, uh, it's a probabilistic distribution. So this is X, and then this is a probability distribution of H given X. So this is a something, you know, an idea of a uh, of a probabilistic representation is what's called as a restricted Boltzmann machine. Is an example. There's some, or uh, or another simple way to think about it is some kind of Markov network. If you're familiar with probabilistic graphical model, a Markov network is a probability distribution whose parameters we learn, and it's representing the distribution of the data set that you're providing here in terms of probability distribution. And you can sample from that, we refer to the sampling layer. So given that it's a probability distribution, we can sample it to produce whatever images we want. We get high probability versions and low probability versions and so on. Generating, generative models, uh, modeling approaches, which emphasize connection with autoencoder, or this idea called variational autoencoder, which is again the topic of uh, next week. 
and then something called generative stochastic network. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the first half of most of what I wanted to say is about these three methods of representation autoencoders, convolutional neural networks and then uh, recurrent neural networks and the idea of transfer learning. So now let us ask some other broad questions. It is all about representation. So, what is a good representation for machine learning? Uh, one answer is that representation makes subsequent learning easier and says the choice usually depends on subsequent learning task. So, a feed forward network, think of it, this whole thing deep learning is learning a function. Take an input, produce an output, right? So, it is a, a function, the definition of a function. So, a feed forward network f of x can be written as f3 of f2 of f1 of x, x is input to f1 that goes on to f2 that goes on to f3 and that is your function. Uh, a feed forward network trained by supervised learning performs representation learning. Every hidden layer makes the classification easier. Example classes not linearly separable in the input features may become linearly separable in the last layer. So, this is a uh, this is a complicated problem of cats and dogs, but somehow it is extracting some features. So, eventually it comes into a representation, disentangled features. So, it is only these independent features these are and so it is very simple to classify these things. So, in a way these uh, these representations make the task easier, it is a very broad statement, but uh, that is the kind of thing we, we like to achieve here, all right. So, an ideal representation is one that disentangles the underlying causal factors of variation that generated the data especially those that are relevant to our application. So, there is lots of examples you know wonderful examples people have given you know like you are trying to do face recognition and uh, you end up saying okay the face also has all these properties that causal variations in the face people may be smiling they might be frowning or sleeping or wearing glasses or what have you. So, uh, you have all these factors of variation that happens and we never intended that any of these things to be coded into it. We were just interested in face recognition, but it is finding out these are the factors of variation and these are all entangled in our data set and uh, this is uh, the kind of thing we would like to see in our methods. Most strategies for representation learning are based on introducing clues that help the uh, learning to find these underlying factors of variation. So, we of course, provide all kinds of clues like regularization is an example we saw earlier on here again there are so many methods people have been developing and uh, these might be uh, how to get those disentanglements. And so, the qualities of a representation are they should be as informative as the data, data is very informative, they should be invariant or unaffected by nuisance factors or noise. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier on when we talked about pooling. Uh, I talked about how convolutional networks have this convolutional layer followed by pooling layer. The question comes in what is this pooling layer? What is it doing? It is usually introducing some kind of invariance that uh, images that are rotated and so on, you should be invariant to that, you should be able to recognize it irrespective of, of those kinds of things. So, pooling uh, does that. And uh, so, anyway, the quality of the representation are they should be disentangled be as, as simple as possible and easy to work with. In other words, for a representation to be optimized to the task at hand, it should find the right trade off between accuracy and complexity. So, these are again the broad uh, broad goals here. So, if you are working with any domain, uh, you can say well I would like to find representations that are meaningful and this has got implications to the explainable AI part of it, all right. This is something we encounter all the time untangling all right you pull out your uh, earphone from your pocket to listen to music and it's all entangled so what is what is un un untangling or disentanglement make something complicated or confusing easier to understand or deal with so this is tangled uh, inadvertently and we want to disentangle it uh, so that we can connect it to our phone and our ear right all right tangling and disentangling this is <laughs> these words are used all kinds of ways uh, philosophically, right. Uh, sometimes we tangle things purposefully, right. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we aim to deceive, right. Walter Scott is a poem that we purposely 
uh, he knew he'd have to disentangle or untangle a financial mess and somehow restore investor confidence. So entanglement, un untangling and so on, these are all common ideas we talk about in, in life. Turns out uh, this is what some of the AI methods are trying to do, uh, how to disentangle. All right. Anyway, I wanted to uh, have a few, few slides here of what one of my PhD students is working on. We are again in this area of uh, handwriting and we are looking at, uh, uh, he uses, he calls this a Siamese network where we are trying to compare two sets of, uh, two sets of images whether they came from the same writer or not. He runs them through convolutional networks followed by a, by a simply connected layer, fully connected layer and the same with the two examples and uh, uses uh, these representations that are obtained to be able to find uh, the probability that they were written by the same evidence and object uh, using cross entropy laws. So he's implementing this kind of stuff. Um, and it's an interesting task for the explanation based AI. Uh, these, these are a lot of forensic problems. When I presented the evidence and the known, you're saying are they the same or not? It turns out like a, what is that, a binary classification problem? Yes or no? These two are from the same or this from, are not, are from, not from the same. The answer to this is uh, quite uh, profound and, uh, and particularly in the forensic domain and you want to give a confidence. How sure are you that this came from the same or did, did not come from the same? Uh, that's the kind of testimony they want in the, in the, in the courtroom for a, in the US they use a jury system where lay people who know nothing about the domain Ordinary people are sitting in judgment uh, whether, and they just are hearing what the expert is saying and they like to hear the testimony in as simple a way as possible. You can't just couch it in uh, things that are black boxes. Yes, the algorithm said so, it's just not enough. You'll have to uh, give uh, more of an explanation and uh, these methods, uh, we, what we're trying to do is disentangle the variables to say why do you say they're the same? what is it that makes you say the same and say it in a way that I can understand uh, why they're the same or they're not the same. Uh, and what this is my student Jun Chu has been doing. Uh, this is a simple auto encoder. You are mapping these images uh, using encoder function that we just saw what an auto encoder is. He uses a variational auto encoder which creates a, a multidimensional probability distribution over here from the data set and uh, you now uh, are able to decode by sampling in this process. So it becomes a probabilistic method referred to as a variational auto encoder representation. And uh, what good is this is it discovers all kinds of manifolds and tells you, uh, tells you what kind of uh, uh, underlying features exist. So what he's showing is that this is finding a manifold, a semantic manifold in a high dimensional space and uh, it has got all these advantages, interpretability, sand transferability, invariance, compute forensic comparison. It says, he was looking at handwritten ANDs and says the ANDs all lie in some kind of a space over here, some kind of manifold and I'll show you some examples of, of what those uh, mean. So he generates images from the manifold and uh, in, uh, red boxes contain original images. So in this red box are original images in a data set the word and written by several people. And uh, if you traverse along a dimension in latent space, so he creates a latent space of 20 dimensions. So that box now has 20 dimensional space and uh, Z naught is the shape of D and uh, taking a, any image and you can move that parameter and create all kinds of handwritten images just along the shape of D. Uh, so every image, this is the original image, these are all artificial images. And we are just uh, here uh, dealing with uh, one variable called Z naught and this are the, are the zeroth feature. Loop size of D again, you're dealing with uh, original images and you can move in either direction, create artificial images uh, that have something to do with loop size of D. Vertical position of D again is the third one and so on. So what he is able to discover is that these handwritten images have inherent variables which is the shape of D, loop size of D, vertical position of D, that's about three of them out of 20 or so features he generates. And, uh, and so this is the 
uh, understanding gets with uh, with with the, with the, what the underlying representation is about. So he also shows attribute vectors from data, and uh, in previous slide the traverse is along one dimension in latent space, and here the traverse is along a so-called attribute vector which points from the first hand image to the second hand image from below to the upper one. So he says there's a trajectory going on here, and he's showing it in two dimensional space here how these uh, images are changing from one to the next on the manifold uh, and he, you know this is based on the on the VAE. So the attribute vector points in a direction that makes the writing shorter. We apply this attribute vector to other images we see the same effect. So he's studying these kinds of things. All right and uh, so we come to the so we, we, where are we there so we talked about uh, uh, these various methods of representation, transfer, transferability, and uh, uh, and untangling of variables. Okay, so the last part. This is a a, a major frontier of uh, AI research today. DARPA has a program uh, called Explainable AI, and uh, so their motivation is this. Today, AI is in this way. You have training data. You have a machine learning process and you learn a function from input to the output. So you learn the function whatever convolutional networks, auto encoders um, and eventually you learn a function to map input to output and provide a decision or recommendation. Let's say classification is a problem. We provide uh, a decision or recommendation and uh, uh, so there is the task and here is the user who is now scratching his head here. The user, the user is asking questions such as, "Why did you do that?" Right? So, oh, okay. Why did you say the two handwriting samples uh, were the same? We got to say, "Look, the shape of D or vertical position of D, these kinds of things." I could use it in my explanation. The latent space is providing all of this information, and it's not without explanation. So we could possibly answer that. But the kind of questions the user could be asking is, "Why did you do that?" why not something else right this could be another broad set of decisions and uh, another question is uh, when do you succeed right um, when do you fail can you answer these questions when can i trust you <laughs> right so it seems like an important thing uh, should i use ai to drive my car or uh, not today right uh, and then how do I uh, how do I correct uh, an error? Okay, these are the kinds of questions that uh, can arise with an AI system used for a profound application. So the uh, XAI, which is the explainable art, <laughs> nice acronym for it, XAI is explainable artificial intelligence, uh, is a training data. So we may be modifying the machine learning process. Is that what they're proposing? I'm saying, well, we've already got some answers to it. This, un this untangling of variables using variational autoencoders. And some of these VAEs and GANs and so on, they seem to be providing that kind of information which explains things. So you can regard them as the new machine learning process as opposed to standard convolutional networks or standard autoencoders. So this could be the new machine learning process. Maybe there is more to be done on that, which gives us an explainable model. So it is not simply providing the classification providing with uh, intermediate information. But uh, we may want now also an explanation interface, right, to be able to answer the kind of questions the user may have, after which the user with a smile on his face, previously he was scratching his head, now with a smile on his face, he says, I understand why, I understand why not, and uh, I know when you succeed, I know when you fail, I know when to trust you, and I know why you erred, right? So this is uh, the range of things that uh, uh, could be happening uh, with, uh, all right? Okay, so that's about all for my, uh, for my kind of quick overview of the full range of, uh, of deep learning from, convol or from convolutional neural networks to RNNs to the whole thing. As you can see, it's a vast area with uh, huge numbers of people working on all of these subtopics. But the topic that 
you know, I hope some of you will look at is representation learning, what that means, or, or the explainable AI that seems like an exciting area to work on. Okay, so I'm happy to take any questions you might have, or maybe add some comments to what I did. Maybe you can expand on that, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, those slides I just got it like two days ago from Jun Chu. <laughs> uh, he's working on his PhD now. So that's uh, that's the work he's doing on explainable uh, forensics, explainable. Yeah. So this issue of, uh, this is similar to principal component analysis, if you're familiar with it, you know, you can, uh, tells you, it maps the data into a new, a new world where the first component is more important than the second component and third component, things like that. And you lose the importance as you go down, saying that hardly matters, you know. So I suppose one could look at it the same way and say which ones are important to show up first. Uh, because you're in some uh, latent space, you know, it is just, you're dealing with a Gaussian distribution that is mapping the data into and that is capturing, those are the latent variables. And it's an interesting question as to uh, the importance of these, uh, of these uh, individual features, which ones are more important than others. I don't know, maybe go through PCA of that? I don't know, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I've been kind of looking at the, uh, at different papers at least from my small sample, it seems like 300 seems to be so popular in the uh, in the NLP community. I thought it was just arbitrary number for one paper. Then I went to this uh, stuff about tweets and all. They're again using 300. Seems like a magic number. Uh, maybe some of the other folks uh, who have worked with uh, NLP and deep learning get a add to that. You know. So in these few papers I've seen, it seems to be 300. Maybe it's not necessary to go go beyond that uh, for the kinds of corpuses they're working with, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, some of us who have been working on classical machine learning approaches for a long time have come up with solutions that are pretty good for some problems. And then we say, well, okay, we can, uh, let's try this with deep learning. It's just, oh, it doesn't do as well as my simple machine learning methods I used earlier on. But you know, that earlier simple machine learning methods we developed earlier on took many, many years of hard work and to figuring out what those feature extractors are for that task and all that. In the forensic domain, we've developed a software tool that's generally available. People can use it. It works pretty good. Where did you get all the features from? Well, we hand engineered all those. We wrote all the code that extracted those features and then did some kind of a simple naive base classifier to say whether the same or not. And we are now hard pressed to do the same thing by simply using deep learning. But you got to keep in mind, deep learning is about uh, solving new types of problems. There might be specific uh, problems where, uh, where we have uh, better solutions. Even the knowledge-based AI, rule-based AI, that rule-based AI is good for explanation. If you're interested in explanation-based AI, rule-based uh, 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 systems, uh, Bayesian networks, Bayesian networks, you can go through, how did you arrive at this decision? You can go through all the variables that uh, were set in what values and so on, you can answer the question easily. So explainable AI is easy for the older systems. The newer systems have that problem that we have huge numbers of parameters and we have to re-engineer some of these machine learning methods to be able to explain. So there are advantages with the older AI approaches 
uh, but the newer AI approaches can do a lot more and, and things, uh, do, do things better. And as long as we engineer the explainability, I think uh, they will be better as well, right. But we are in this transition phase, the old is sometimes better than the new. Hmm. Are we really learning? Hmm? Are we? Well, when we when we have these disentangled variables, uh, so we are kind of pushing it in some direction, and it's coming out with a representation. That's why we have all these ultimate goals. What is an ideal representation? Disentangle the variables, uh, make the next layer task simpler. So you have to keep in mind these objectives. So now, how do we uh, engineer the system uh, to do that? And these VAEs and GANs and so on, they, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more, they seem to uh, do, do a good job in, in, in doing this. So it, this is all heading towards this explainable AI again to see uh, uh, which, uh, which representations uh, are better and how can we learn them. We're just throwing images at it. And it's coming out and saying, well, you know, this, these people are smiling, these people are frowning and things. It comes out like that, saying it's learning a representation which we didn't explicitly hard code and it, it, it's learning that now, right? Okay. We are not there fully yet. This is a research topic, but this is what we want to do. Hmm. Hmm. You know, uh, in in this deep learning, the broad thing here is we want to we want to do minimal amount of hand crafting. Okay, all these adjacency matrix and things you're talking about is something you thought of. Saying I'm going to have this adjacency matrix input. We're saying forget about all that. You know, it should learn. There are all kinds of interesting examples. Uh, where these deep learning methods learn uh, wrong things. Apparently they had this task of learning uh, animals, you know. It turned out that uh, the all the horse pictures had a copyright uh, symbol on that image. And the whole uh, program learned whenever it says copyright on it, it's a horse. <laughs> it's cheating. Uh, so a deep learning program can also learn to cheat. Uh, without learning the real task. Apparently there was another one about robot manipulation where uh, it was supposed to learn how to move an object with the, with the arm, you know, the robot. And it ended up learning things if it puts the arm between the camera and the object where uh, it cannot see what's happening because it's uh, occluding. Uh, it learned something that should be occluding the camera, something irrelevant to the actual manipulation. So the data is telling you something like that. So it can learn things that were not intended. And of course, in your case, though, with the adjacency matrix and all that is some kind of method of representation you're suggesting. But our goal here is to move away. We have to move away from uh, uh, providing uh, any kind of additional clues, although we have some parametric ideas and parameter space and so on, we, we give that. And uh, also in this explainable AI to be able to say that uh, it's not using copyright information, it's actually using. Anyway, so, so the, you see the challenge is here. So we want to be totally free of, of any kind of design and it should learn and also be able to say how we did that. Yeah, it's a, it, this, this forensic matching problem is a harder problem uh, than the simple recognition of characters, recognition of words, things like that. To be able to say whether the styles are the same or not. And how do you tell whether the styles of two uh, handwritings are the same? 
there are forensic experts who can tell you what they do but it's very ad hoc they'll have some simple rules of the loopy d or a straight d so on and uh, uh whereas this program comes out and tells you something about what what features those ought to be which is what is exciting here yeah, in an explainable way today the human beings are not able to tell in a lot of these tasks how do you recognize this person we are not able to describe how it is you, you recognize this person you could you could try introspection doesn't help in a lot of these problems whereas these programs are able to explicitly come out and say these are the reasons why i am able to tell of course you got to train it uh, these are all coming from the same or they did not coming from the same you have to train it on such data sets and it learns that and we are looking at these manifolds to understand better what is the features they are learning Yeah, it's all probabilistic. That's the thing with with all of these machine learning. This is everything is probabilistic here, and the p-value or whatever uh, you want to use. Uh, we are we are dealing with underlying probabilistic models, uh, which again the generative models, which I'll talk about. And uh, so yes, so we come out with some kind of a confidence here. In the forensic domain, we need to come out with what's called as a likelihood ratio. That's being accepted more more in the Western courts now, and so on. Is uh, you divide the probability that those two came from the same divided by the probability those two did not come from the same, and uh, so you provide that's called as a likelihood ratio. Uh, and you take a the likelihood ratio can go from you know zero to one. and uh, you know the log likelihood ratio uh, wait a minute likelihood likelihood ratio can go from uh, the, you are dividing two probabilities so it can be huge or it can be small it's not zero to so it can be a huge number infinity <laughs> one probability is much higher the other one is zero so it's infinity or the denominator is huge and the numerator is small so it's, it's uh, close to zero 0.00001 so likelihood ratio is a is a huge range from infinity to zero you take a log likelihood ratio llr it's called log likelihood ratio uh, you know turns out to be positive values and negative values if the value is above 1 the um, you know the log likelihood is positive if the value is between 0 and 1 the log likelihood is negative so you get now values uh, minus 300 or uh, or or plus 200 log likelihood ratio numbers are smaller than actual raw likelihood ratio numbers so we provide these things and then you use the likelihood ratio information together with the prior information to come up so you multiply the likelihood by the prior to get the posterior that's a standard base bayesian approach uh, and where do you get the prior from is uh, you could use it use things like what is the population ah oh, this crime was committed by one of 200 people who stays in this uh, in this dormitory so it's one in 200 prior or it could be done anyone by by this city of 10 million people that's one in 10 million is so you can multiply the prior with the likelihood ratio to get a posterior probability so it's kind of interesting uh, area of calculating these kinds of things probabilities for this forensic domain Mm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know this is again uh, a problem that uh, Kalman filters or whatever people have been working with uh, things that are time varying uh, information um LSTMs seem like they are designed for this kind of thing this is long short term memory so you got to remember old stuff but you can't remember everything from the old stuff you will be overwhelmed uh but you have to keep certain information and then you have to bring in new information 
this little module called the LSTM seems to be doing that very cleverly. Right? So they are able to uh, combine, the, it says, that's why it's called LSTM, long short term memory, both incorporated into the same model and it is time varying, they say it's a recurrent neural network and, uh, and you know, doing something along these lines. Actually, a lot of the most exciting research in deep learning is uh, led by the language processing folks. I think you have a active group here in the department. I saw some announcement. If you have a natural language processing group here, seems to be the right kind of thing to do. That's where they are they're leading everyone else, saying this is uh, um, these are the kinds of problems that you haven't thought of. Like like Professor Narayan, your question is about uh, it's continual learning you have to be doing. And uh, right, just like us professors, <laughs> we have to be continually learning to be able to teach this. But we still have some value in the old stuff we learned, uh, and we want to uh, still use that. So we are all long, short-term memories uh, doing that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me see. Uh, it, it seems like a nice question. Uh, you're talking about uh, is it simply improving CNNs and RNNs, or is it coming up with uh, uh, totally new models? Yeah, you know, both are happening. Uh, it's amazing how well the CNNs do. So it's worth learning about CNNs and RNNs. They've, they've done an extremely good job. Um, Whereas some of these newer models, you know, I think I mentioned it to you. Jeffrey Hinton, he says all these old models are, are no good. We got to start all over again. We got to have these capsule nets and all that kind of thing. So there are, uh, so today a lot of good practical stuff can be done with modern practice of deep learning. But uh, do they solve all the issues? Probably not. Uh, and where are these shortcomings? Uh, explainable AI is one thing, but there are so many other things about you know uh, memory and uh, you know long term memory and all these issues uh, and i think so it's very uh, game playing is a very active group here uh, it seems like that is again uh, another important area i'll touch upon that briefly again next time when i talk about generative adversarial networks some ideas there might might be coming but there's just a huge rich area to look at I would say CNN's type of stuff is probably modern practice. Just, you know, that's how it's done today. All it is is, is a huge network. But these ideas of variational networks uh, and, and generative models, um, I think are exciting. What has happened historically is um, er, very early in the day in pattern recognition, we used to talk about generative model like Bayes, Bayes rule. Those things went away when uh, discriminative models became very popular like SVM and uh, neural networks in a supervised manner, those became important. Today, again, uh, the focus is on generative models with these kinds of things as VAEs, variation autoencoders, and generative adversarial networks, and so on. So people kind of move in a, like a group, you know, everybody saying this next thing seems to be uh, interesting. So that's where uh, people seem to be at this point before capsule net takes over, you know. Anyway, lots of exciting things to be done in, in, this, in this field. For, and of course, sometimes you might be led by the kind of problems you want to solve. Game playing might be rich in these kinds of things. You want to learn. Uh, I don't know if anyone has tried uh, uh, deep learning to play bridge. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, these pe people have looked at. I used to have a colleague who actually wrote a p program to play uh, poker actually long ago. But uh, we can rethink all those problems again with these new tools that are made available to us. Saying, how can we solve those problems? We might come up with some whole new um, ideas. But it's all fully phrased in good mathematics, lots of data. So it's, uh, it's uh, believable that it's not arbitrary. Somebody saying you must do it like this. It's, it's very hard, hard science. That's what it is. <laughs> Yeah, 
You know, um, uh, some of the stuff that I presented, I think last time or so, they actually refer, this idea came from Hopfield Net, this idea from Kohona Network. Those ideas are still there. They have not gone away. Those are all very powerful techniques that have inspired some things with the new names now, right? Some, some names carry on, like Perceptron seems to still carry on uh, and others, you know, forgotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, generalization is what I talked about, right? We got all this old slew of regularization methods to do generalization. They studied this versus that versus that versus that, right? Dropout and things like these, they all seem to do a good job. Is there a science to it? Is there one way of regularization? One way of generalization? You know, is it just a prior probability? Is it the uh, L2 norm or L3 norm or what kind of little things I could do? You know, we can just say these are all the range of things that have been done to generalize. They seem to do well. And uh, with this issue of uh, transfer learning, uh, it seems uh, it's motivated more by practicality. It's saying uh, I don't have the resources for my domain. I only have so many images or so much data available. And can I learn from other data? Language is an example, you know. So after all, the dependencies between words and things like that can be useful for something more than machine translation. Uh, it could be question answering or uh, whatever other things people do with language, right? Question answering is a, is a common one. Uh, and so the same concepts of language uh, are built upon you know, the same deep representations here. So that's the generalizability over there. Of course, you could say, well, let me learn all of this exactly from question answering point of view. Uh, would I be learning anything different from the point of view of language translation from the language, right? So there might be some specialized things. So if you're going between English and German, uh, you might be learning something very peculiar about those two languages. So you might be branching off a little bit there. But at core, the uh, methods, the representations might be all uh, common, right? And uh, so whether uh, the NLP folks have studied uh, uh, regularization strategies, how they influence uh, their work, I, know, I don't know about that. I've seen largely all the regularization methods in the context of images and all that. But then we also are saying there's not much of a difference between images and language. Everything is just an RNN or LSTM. All numbers, all gradient descent. That, that's interesting. All of the learning is taking place using gradient descent. This is what Jeffrey Hinton is complaining about. The brain is not doing gradient descent, you know, <laughs> right? which is all the weights. And you see how much it changes, goes and, you know, update the weights by using the you know, derivatives and all that. So, you know, he doesn't believe that oh, that's what's happening. Maybe there's another revolution that will say uh, that's not what we should be doing. And the other thing also key to keep in mind is that the, we learn things with very few examples, right? A child learns something with one example of a, of a dog or a cat and, and is able to recognize a dog or a cat next. We're not giving it hundreds of examples to learn, right? Uh, how does that happen? Of course, we have answers to that with deep learning community, which is the unsupervised part. It says, uh, you learn the representation uh, with, uh, with unsupervised learning. You're just looking at things and somebody says, oh, that's a cat. Now we're putting that whole thing, that whole method as, as a cat now. So it is possible to combine unsupervised learning and supervised learning. You have got lots of data about unsupervised. You're just observing things in nature. And then somebody gives you one example and says, that's a cat. That, that, that one example is called one-shot learning. With only one example, you learned the concept. And, and now we are matching it because it, this kind of data, it, 
is has been labeled that one example, but you have learnt all the variation about it. So it is uh, it's possible to combine uh, combine these these ideas together. Wow, yeah, I think transfer learning itself as a regularizer. Well, the regularizer's job is, uh, of course, the generalization capability. And we are trying to connect here with this discussion that that is somehow being connected to uh, transfer learning. And uh, so if you are able to do different tasks, there is a nice discussion on these. Actually, I have a few lecture slides on this on transfer learning, the computational graphs for transfer learning and so on. So uh, you may want to look at that a little bit. But I am I'm not aware very specifically of what you're saying, right? Yeah. Summer is the time when the best conferences are being held in the US. You would have noticed that. May, June, July, August, when most academics are uh, free to focus on research rather than teaching. Or ICML or all these conferences are going on. I just picked up one, and uh, Yan Lekun is my Facebook friend. You know, he, he's the Facebook AI guru. He puts all these interesting stuff out there. Uh, the one I mentioned about the embedded space for uh, for uh, languages, historic history of languages. So um, anyway, you may want to look at uh, look at these conferences, uh, see what's going on. Uh, maybe you're going to some of them. I'm finding social media, with all its negative stuff, I'm finding it valuable to keep up with uh, with current work. You know, people are posting uh, very interesting stuff in, in an interesting way. Of course, with all the comments coming on it uh, and so on. So, recommend keeping up with it by following some of these uh, interesting groups or people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for attending my lecture number three. <laughs>